Yeah, since not that many people actually know why you have professors in universities, um, thought I'd, I'd tell you. Um, <laughs> there's a reason I get paid. And one of those is to crank out engineers, because engineers really are um, the drones of, of the corporation. We get the job done, we produce those products that you all want and need desperately, and do it at a low cost so that it can be sold um, at the warehouse. <coughs> So, <laughs> so I have a vital role in society, by the way. <laughs> so how do you ma mass manufacture things at a low price? Uh, you know, that's, th that's what we want to know and that's what we want to pass on. All right, then I'm supposed to come up with new knowledge as well. That's another part of my job, to do research, to, because I'm supposed to keep on top of what's known and understand where the edge of what's known is, I'm supposed to actually add to that. I'm supposed to chip away at that coal face of knowledge and produce new knowledge. And a lot of times, that's so we can have more stuff, right? That's uh, new products, new materials, um, yep. But sometimes it's um, new energy conversion devices and, um, and um, new medical treatments and, and other new things like that. So um, good thing people are, are thinking about these things. And then we're supposed to create new ideas and new solutions. So the problems that are being faced, we're, there's supposed to be somebody in universities working on those. Universities are where new ideas just spring from. And, um, and it's because those people have a bit of freedom to look at problems that there's not profit in, right? The problem of how you get silky shiny hair, there's profit in because we can you know, come up with a nice formulation for a, for a new shampoo that smells great and, and get you to buy it. But the problems that, um, that we can work on at universities with, with PhD students and master's students, they can be the ones that, that are really hard and that it's hard to, um, hard to really make a buck off of working on them. So it's hard to get somebody to fund them. So that's sort of one of the areas I work in. And then we're supposed to actually develop useful things out of doing that. Now, nowadays we're looking at nano things, you know, things that you can't even see. <laughs> it's really good. You can't see it and you can't tell what it is, but look at what it does. Isn't that nice? Um, but uh, yeah, so we're supposed to contribute. So not just finding out stuff, not just research, but development. So that's my job. And um, what have I been working on lately? Well, what are the facts? You know, what, what do we really know? What's known? about the mineral resources that we burn and use for, for moving around. Transport fuels, we call them. Well, the facts really aren't that hard to figure out. If you look into how oil is made, um, or was made, and where it was made, and why, why it didn't end up where it was and, and in, the, in the form it is, it's a, a finite resource, that's for sure. And, um, and really, We've found it, and people have bit gotten really good at getting it. And what there is, we've we've got about half of it. And from here on out, the supply of it's going to start to to go down and get more and more expensive. So yes, I know the the price of a barrel of oil has has gone down um, over the last few months, or it's gone back back down to what it was that shockingly high, unbelievable price of six months ago. But um, if you ask me, that's, um, it, 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 that's somebody doing this, pumping. Okay, every time you get a cycle going where, where the price of something skyrockets and then plummets and then skyrockets, that's somebody sucking money out of, <laughs> out of the economy. All right, so, so, if, so because they got oil driven up so high, now when it falls, they can make money again because they'll drive it back up again. So, so watch this space for the price of oil to just oscillate wildly, um, probably from here on out. And in that um, space, you're going to have to try and go about your business and do your thing. <laughs> All right. So the, the amount of oil um, is sort of peaking and, and in decline any way you look at it. And um, one of the research projects that we've done is to actually sit down and look at that. And if, if you think about it, the government, it was a year and a half ago that the government in its first print media ever, the words peak oil existed. That's a bit behind the ball. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit late to be thinking about it. So we thought, well, what is it that is so hard for the government to actually get their head around on this? It's just a mineral resource. 
And it's, it is what it is, and it's not that hard to figure out. It must be a communication issue. So what we decided to do was take um, the, the issue of peak oil, which, okay, it's very entertaining. How many of you have, have read a book about peak oil or watched a movie about it? There's a whole entertainment industry. I think it's a genre now, right? There's, there's probably in the video store a section, you know, peak oil videos. And so it might be something that's a little bit hard to say, okay, you know, this is a policy issue because it seems maybe like it's something else. So what we did was we did an, anal um, an analysis of all of the oil wells or all of the oil producing um, groups and countries in the world, their production rates, um, Almost all of them have peaked, and since the time that we did this, the last one has peaked. Um, and you just can calculate, having some assumptions about the way that they're going to taper off the way that they came up, what the probability is that the supply in, in this year is going to be this much below the 2005 supply. So the way you read this is you say, okay, I want to think about 20, 2015, 2015, 2015. That's six years from now, right? Six, seven years from now. Um, what are you all going to be doing in, in six or seven years? Any gonna, anybody going to be retired in seven years? Okay. Well. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. Seven years. That, that's not too long from now, right? If I had a, a, a child starting high school, they would be finished. I have a, my son is, is going to start uni next year. You know, with all hope, he'll, he'll be finished by then and, and earning a living. Um, so that's not that far from now. So if we look at 2015, um, the, the peak in production will surely have occurred by then. And there's a 50% chance, 50% probability, that we will be using 7% less. Right? So that's sort of, the, the just looking at the production rates, there's a 50-50 chance that, that um, the amount of oil in, in the world um, market will be 7% less than what it was in 2005. 10% um, reduction, about a 30% chance. 15% uh, less than in 2025, only about a 2% chance, and probably there, you know, we'll, we'll have a, at least 80% of what we use in 20, um, 2005. <coughs> All right, you want to look a little bit farther out, where it gets interesting is when you start looking at 2025. So another 10 years later. By then, um, peak oil, peak production was certain to have happened. Um, some moderate reductions will have happened. Um, the 15% reduction is very likely to have happened, 86% probability that will have happened. And the 20% reduction there's almost a 60% chance that, that by 2025 we'll be using 20% um, less fuel than in 2005. Now that sort of thing is the sort of thing you can sit down and start planning with. Peak oil, ah, uh, can't plan for that. You, what do you do about that? But you can say, okay, look, there's, there's um, some numbers. We can actually sit down and start to look at what that means. We can start to look at, well, if there's a new development here, and the nearest place they could possibly go to work is 40 kilometers from here, that by 2025, their property values will be tanking because it's, you know, it'll be very expensive for them to get somewhere and we won't be able to afford to run a, you know, run a bus out to them. So, so maybe we won't allow that development out there now because in 10, 15 years, those property values are gonna be at risk, all right? So this is work that we actually did for the government and that um, there's actually been um, a start of some <coughs> planning around this. The transport planners are starting to try and work this into their model. What they don't, what into their models for, for transit design and traffic design, what they, um, what this should tell you is that all that spend up we were planning on doing because of all the congestion we've got, we can save all that money. In figures, why they want to widen to four lanes and this sort of stuff is because of 2% annual increases. And we're looking at, at actual decreases of about 2 to 3%. So um, hopefully we just saved the government a lot of money.